Okay, so for this video, I'm going to be doing something a bit different. I'm going to be ranking the Guardians of Light by performance. What I mean by that is, I'm going to be ranking them based on how well they did during the Keyblade War in Kingdom Hearts 3. What they brought to the table, how well they fought, how much they contributed to the Guardians winning the battle, etc. Now, I want to let it be known here and now that this is not a power scaling video. Number one, because I'm not a power scaler. And number two, power scaling in Kingdom Hearts, especially during the Keyblade War in KH3, is kind of like, good luck, honestly. There's a few characters who should have performed way better during the battle based on what they've done in the past. For example, Aqua goes from defeating Terra Xehanort at the end of Birth by Sleep to barely being able to detect his movements. Sora getting kicked around by Xemnas when he was able to defeat a version of Xemnas that was amped by a partial Kingdom Hearts. There's just a lot of mental gymnastics that you would have to do to make sense of it, in my opinion. Now, with that being said, I will obviously talk about what these characters have shown to be able to do in the past before going over how they performed in the Keyblade War, while also providing context to justify their placements. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how strong these characters are or how strong they should be. What matters is what they did with that strength when it came down to the decisive battle. Lastly, for those who don't know, there are actually nine Guardians of Light. According to the Kingdom Hearts 3 Ultimania, the nine Guardians are Sora, Riku, Mickey, Aqua, Ventus, Axel, Kairi, Roxas, and Terra. So unfortunately for the Xion fans, she is not considered to be a Guardian. Now with that, let's get started. At number nine, I have Axel. Axel, without a doubt, is the worst performing Guardian in my opinion. He gets annihilated throughout the entire Keyblade War. He gets knocked out by Terra Xehanort and he just gets destroyed by Xemnas with no effort, to the point where he has to sit out and be replaced by Roxas because of his injuries. Now in Remind, the events are slightly different. Axel does fight Xemnas alongside Roxas and Shion despite his injuries, which is impressive. However, he still sits out for a bit after this fight, but let's be completely honest. Axel and Shion wouldn't be able to do anything against Xemnas without Roxas being there. But other than this, Axel does trade blows with Saix pretty evenly, but even then, Saix is clearly not going full force against Axel or any of the other Guardians. For those who don't know, Saix had been working behind the scenes to help the Guardians even before the Keyblade War started. But regardless, Axel also does well in the group battle against the Replica Xehanorts, but to be fair, so does everyone else, which is why I wanted to mention this specific fight now. That way I won't have to keep mentioning it for the other Guardians on this list. All of them fought very well during this particular battle. Now, something I do want to address as it pertains to Axel and Kairi is the training. So prior to the Keyblade War, Axel and Kairi had been training in a forest where time flows differently from the outside world. Because of this, Axel and Kairi were able to do long-term training in a short amount of time. However, both Axel and Kairi were still no match for the 13 Darknesses, at least individually, which has obviously fueled the Kairi is useless narrative and honestly, I get it, but I want to explain why it makes complete sense that their training ultimately didn't pay off at all. So I've looked into this through KH3 as well as the supplementary material and it's never stated what Axel and Kyrie's training actually entailed other than them sparring against each other. Now the reason I don't like this is because if their entire training regimen only consisted of them sparring against each other as brand new Keyblade wielders then that's not even viable training. Of course, they're not going to improve that much if they're only sparring against each other because prior to this training, Kairi had basically no combat experience at all, let alone with a Keyblade, and Axel, while he did have combat experience, he had no proficiency with a Keyblade. So again, them sparring against each other as training made absolutely no sense. It's the equivalent of taking any anime protagonist who's at the start of their journey and pairing them with another character who also doesn't know anything and saying, train without them having any kind of direction from a master. Now, some people may point out that Sora and Riku perform just fine, even though they've never had formal training either, but here's the difference. Since the very beginning of Kingdom Hearts, 
Sora and Riku have been thrust into intense battle after intense battle, so they have raw combat experience with the Keyblade. However, if you notice, both Sora and Riku struggle heavily when faced with Keyblade wielders who were trained by an actual Keyblade master. So as far as Axel and Kairi are concerned, even if they sparred against each other in a place where they can do long term training quickly, it wouldn't be enough to prepare them for this kind of battle. And it didn't. Which is why Kairi requesting to train under Aqua at the end of Melody of Memory makes perfect sense, because she should actually improve from this training, compared to her sparring with Axel. With that out of the way, I have Ventus at number 8. Ventus is strong. We know this because in Birth by Sleep, he did defeat Vanitas, who was wielding the X-Blade, although the blade itself was imperfect, however, still an impressive feat. Now, during the Keyblade War though, Ventus is just really off his game because he was so concerned about Terra. I would argue that he was more concerned about Terra than the actual outcome of the Keyblade War, to the point where he just carelessly lets his guard down. Ventus is so careless in this battle that even when there's a redo, he still repeats the same actions that got him knocked out by Terra Xehanort the first time. Now, on a more positive note, he's still able to go toe to toe with Vanitas. He doesn't get beat up by him or anything, but once again, because of his concern for Terra, he lets his guard down, allowing Terra Xehanort to injure him to the point where he has to sit out and recover. Kind of disappointing considering his return is supposed to be a really big thing. Up next, I have Aqua at number 7. Aqua is very, very powerful. As we saw in Birth by Sleep, she was able to damage the Imperfect X-Blade by herself, and she was also able to defeat Terra Xehanort, who is an absolute monster. But unfortunately, Aqua doesn't shine that well during the Keyblade War. In the initial battle, she can hardly follow Terra Xehanort's movements, and I suppose you could argue that her guard was down, but I mean, why would she let her guard down after confirming that he wasn't really Terra? But in any case, following this, her heart was suffering from so much fear and despair that she couldn't even bring herself to move before being swept away by the demon tide. Now in the second battle, she performs better. She's keeping up with Terra Xehanort at first, but like Ventus, she lets her guard down, gets injured by Terra Xehanort, and has to sit out and recover. So. Honestly, Aqua, Ventus, and Axel are kind of interchangeable. This is just the order that I would put them in. But in all honesty, and I'm not even joking when I say this, you could probably sub out Axel and Ventus for Donald and Goofy, and I honestly think Donald and Goofy would have performed way better. Donald and Goofy really surprised me during the Keyblade War. Next, I have Roxas at number 6. So throughout 358 over 2 days, we see Roxas's power progression. He gets strong enough to outmuscle Saix and he defeats Shion while heavily fatigued from her absorbing his power. Though you could argue that Shion wasn't really going all out against him, but still impressive regardless. And by the time Roxas awakens his ability to dual wield, Riku can only defeat him by fully tapping into the darkness he was holding back. Fast forward to the Keyblade War, and Roxas doesn't appear to have lost a step at all. When he fights, he does well, he doesn't get decimated at any point, he just shows up and starts handling business, so not much else to say other than that. So above Roxas, I have Riku at number 5. Riku is kind of interchangeable with Roxas as far as how they performed during the Keyblade War, but I'm going to explain why I have Riku higher in a minute. Riku, throughout his entire character arc, has been fighting constantly. He fought Sora in KH1, he fought members of the original Organization 13, he fought an amped Xemnas alongside Sora, he fought Ansem in Chain of Memories and Dream Drop Distance while simultaneously earning the title of Keyblade Master in that same story. And by the start of KH3, he's achieved masterful control over the power of darkness. During the Keyblade War, Riku is still just as strong physically and mentally, and this is shown in the initial battle where all the other guardians besides Riku and Sora are swept away, and Riku continues to stand tall and faces the demon tide by himself. He does lose this encounter, but he was still able to hold off the demon tide for a while, which was pretty remarkable. Now in the redo, 
Riku is just constantly fighting, and I want to note that Riku, like Sora and Mickey, never actually takes a break. Also, he fights alongside Sora and Mickey when they face Ansem, Xemnas, and young Xehanort, who I think we can all agree are probably the strongest of the 13 darknesses aside from Master Xehanort and Terra Xehanort. So that's pretty much why I have Riku above Roxas. Riku fights way more and he performs just as well. I mean, Riku is just him, and he's been him since KH1. Speaking of which, if you haven't already, Check out my Kingdom Hearts Final Mix Explained video where I go super in depth on that story. I'm sure you'll learn some things you didn't already know. Now at number 4 I have Terra. Now initially I wanted to put Riku at number 4 and Terra at number 5 just because again Riku performs well and he does fight more than Terra. However the thing about Terra is that Terra is basically the Itachi of the Kingdom Hearts universe. What I mean by that is, Terra is just a powerhouse that never truly loses. In Birth by Sleep, he defeats his own master, Master Ericus. Then, after getting his body snatched by Master Xehanort, he then defeats Master Xehanort by using his thoughts and emotions to control his armor, the Lingering Will. Then, in the Keyblade War, Terra's Lingering Will is the one that starts to turn the tide of the battle during the redo and the Lingering Will then fights Terra Xehanort and actually overwhelms him to the point of exhaustion. So Terra, by controlling his armor with his thoughts and emotions, is able to perform better against Terra Xehanort than all of the other Guardians, including Sora, who comes back from the future after defeating a Master Xehanort that had full control of the true Kingdom Hearts. Yeah, Sora defeats this amped Master Xehanort and then after going back in time, he gets knocked out by Terra Xehanort. Like this version of Xehanort is just ridiculously overpowered for no apparent reason. Maybe the 13 Darknesses are all being empowered by Master Xehanort, which would make sense I guess? But regardless, Terra whose heart was trapped inside the Guardian, saves Aqua and Ventus later on in the battle and then he proceeds to manhandle Terra Xehanort again until he finally gets his body back. So bottom line, Terra performs better than everyone below him without even having his own body, just his thoughts. It's insane. So at number 3, I have Mickey. Mickey doesn't really have any crazy feats in any of the previous titles, but during the Keyblade War, he fights well against Luxord, Marluxia, and Alarxene. He's able to react to them fairly easy, although he does get trapped temporarily while protecting Sora. Outside of this though, I was super surprised when later on in the battle, the Guardians of Light were all separated while fighting the replica Xehanorts, and Mickey, while heavily fatigued, was able to fend off multiple replica Xehanorts by himself. Now, you could say that Sora was helping towards the end, but Mickey was still holding his own for a while. And as far as I know, it's unclear whether the replica Xehanorts are close to Master Xehanort in power, but if they are, this is an insane feat for Mickey. If not, I would probably bump Mickey down and put Terra at number 3. But either way, this was a very important battle as the Guardians were fighting to close Kingdom Hearts on their side while Sora, Donald, and Goofy fought Master Xehanort and Mickey held it down when everyone else was gone. So at number 2, I have Kairi. Now I know, I know, Kairi's useless, she never does anything, she only exists to be saved, how could she be this high? I know, relax, everyone settle down. Let me explain. Kairi doesn't really do anything physically throughout the Kingdom Hearts series until KH3. I'm not going to go over her training with Axel again because I've already explained why it didn't really help. Now while she doesn't perform that well during the Keyblade War, she is the reason why it was even possible for the Guardians of Light to win the Keyblade War. This is a fact that gets completely overlooked by almost everyone. During the initial battle, when all of the Guardians were swept away by the Demon Tide, Sora was supposed to die when he was hit by the darkness of the Demon Tide, but instead, he doesn't disappear and his heart was held at the final world, the place where people go when their heart and body reach their end, but they don't disappear. When the heart and body reach their end, only the heart is usually able to reach the final world if the person doesn't disappear. 
However, Sora's body was also transported to the final world, and we learn later that not only was Kairi responsible for Sora's heart being held at the final world, but she was also responsible for Sora's body being transported there as well, which again is usually not even possible. But because Sora's body was there, he was able to piece himself together and he then proceeded to use the power of waking to free the hearts of the other guardians. And then he reunites with Kairi inside the Demon Tide, revealing that she had been waiting for Sora inside the Demon Tide the entire time, while keeping Sora's heart from fading away. And the explanation for how Kairi was able to do this is as follows. Using the power of her Heart of Pure Light, the new seven hearts, she had kept Sora's heart from disappearing. Guided by Kairi's hand, they emerge from the darkness returning to the Keyblade Graveyard before their defeat. Meaning because of Kairi, Sora was not only able to erase their previous loss, but he was also able to erase the very moment that he was supposed to die. Now, in the official English translation, Chirithi states that those who don't arrive at the final world are either gone forever or they're still clinging to the world they came from. However, I do want to point out that in the more accurate translation of what Chirithi says, it's not stated that people are gone forever if they don't reach the final world. It's only stated that they disappear, which, let's be honest, in Kingdom Hearts, no one is ever really gone forever when they disappear. But in this case, if Sora really would have disappeared forever if Kairi hadn't held his heart at the final world, then this completely trumps anything that Sora has ever done for Kairi, including Sora going back in time to piece her heart back together, because it's not like Kairi's heart was lost forever. What Kairi did for Sora was literally the ultimate save, on top of the fact that she made it possible for the Guardians to have a do-over. And while some people may say that Kairi didn't really contribute to them winning the second attempt, my counter to that is that there wouldn't even be a second attempt without Kairi. If she wasn't there, they would have lost, period. The only reason people are calling her useless is because she gets captured and she doesn't get any crazy moments as a Keyblade wielder. And I get that, I want Kairi to have those moments too, but it is disingenuous to say that Kairi did not play a vital role in the Guardians of Light winning the Keyblade War. In fact, and I've said this before, Kairi had the most important role, it just wasn't the role that people wanted her to have. And while she isn't nearly the strongest physically, what she's able to do with the strength of her heart is on another level. Now at number one, unsurprisingly, I have Sora. We don't really need to go over Sora's track record as far as his battles before the Keyblade War, it really speaks for itself. But as far as his contributions during the Keyblade War, he uses the power of waking to alter reality and erase their initial loss, he plays a part in the defeat of all 13 darknesses, he fights multiple replica Xehanorts, and ultimately, he alongside Donald and Goofy is the one who defeats Master Xehanort who was wielding the complete X-Blade and had full control of the true Kingdom Hearts. Which, by the way, I love that this final battle included Donald and Goofy. All three of them finishing off Xehanort with a Trinity move is my favorite moment in the series, no joke. But of course, after this, Sora goes back in time again and engages in multiple battles. He does get knocked out by Terra Xehanort, as I mentioned earlier, but he still goes on, traversing heart after heart until he finally restores Kairi at which point he fights and defeats Master Xehanort again alongside Kairi. So yeah, Sora is just built different. But honestly, Sora and Kairi might just be one of the craziest duos in fiction. If Sora is about to die, Kairi can just use the power of her heart to literally say no. And if Kairi is faced with an opponent that she can't beat in a 1v1, Sora can just connect with her heart and help her win even if he's in a different reality. So it's kind of an undefeated tag team. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, check out my Kingdom Hearts Final Mix Explained video next if you're more so interested in the Kingdom Hearts lore. It should be on the screen right now and the link will also be in the description. So thank you and I'll see you guys next time.